So what I thought I would do is take three things that happened to me while I was in the Marines in World War II, what I learned from them, and then take the playbook that basically I realized out of my time as Secretary of State with President Reagan. And if there's time, I might apply that to some problem. So that's the playbook. Well, first of all, I'm in boot camp in the Marine Corps. I remember the day the sergeant hands me my rifle. He says, take good care of this rifle. This is your best friend. And remember one thing, never point this rifle at anybody unless you're willing to pull the trigger. No empty threats. Boot camp wisdom. We have empty threats lying all over the landscape now. It's one of our problems. Nobody pays attention to you if you don't mean what you say and be able to follow through. So I call that boot camp wisdom. I told that story to President Reagan. We were very careful with what we said. Words are precious. Once you issue them, you can't get them back again. So boot camp wisdom, no empty threats. That's realization number one. Number two, we'd taken this little island out in the Pacific and we were there and there was a nearby island where the natives were and the Marines liked to go over and buy grass skirts and log canoes and stuff like that to send home for souvenirs. So we had a deal where they could go over for two hours and I went over and watched this process. And the natives enjoyed the process. The Marines wanted to make deals. Guess what happened to the prices? So finally I had to step in and I said, look, you set a price and the Marines can decide whether they want to buy or not. But when you see the Marines wanting to make deals and the natives wanting to keep the process going, guess what happens to the prices? You can't want a deal too much. The guy who wants a deal too much will get his head handed to him every time. So sometimes when I was in office, congressional committees would say, aren't you upset you haven't made a deal with the Soviet Union? I said, we're not interested in a deal. We're interested in a good deal. When a good deal comes along, then we'll take it. But not until then. So that's the second experience from which I realized something. The third was fairly early in my deployments in combat, and we were sort of defenseless on this island. The Japanese would come and rake us over. And I had, you get into these, you get very close to people. And I had a sergeant named Patton that I thought the world of. He was very able, could do anything. You relied on these sergeants. So we have some action, and I'm looking around for Patton. I run over to where I thought Patton was, and I said, what the hell's Patton? Patton's dead, sir. I'll never forget it. The reality of war sinks in. Wonderful people get killed, injured. So if you're ever in a position to have any impact on a presidential decision to send people into conflict, remember Patton. Be careful. Be sure you have a good mission. Be sure you equip people to be able to achieve the goal that you set out for them. And do it in a way that minimizes the loss of life. So these three lessons from the Marine Corps experience were very important in my subsequent career. Ronald Reagan had an, something happen early in his presidency that hit the world pretty hard. You remember? the air traffic controllers went on strike. And people kept running into the office, Mr. President, Mr. President, this is very complicated. He said, it's not complicated. They took an oath of office, they violated it, they're out. And people said, is the man crazy? How are you gonna keep the planes flying? All over the world, they said, crazy. But he had enough experience from being governor of California that he knew he had to execute. And he had a secretary of transportation who had been chief executive of a large transportation company. So he, he understood the problem. And he also knew how to get something accomplished. So working with the president, first they manned the towers with management people and military people. And they had an aggressive recruiting and training program and they kept the planes flying. And all over the world people said, hey, watch your step, the guy plays for keeps. So he established the fact that he meant what he said, 
could take a stand on principle, and then he could make it work. That's essential. Once you establish yourself that way, people pay attention to you. And if you don't establish that, it's hard to get very far. So that's point one. Point two, be realistic. Throw away your rose-covered glasses. See the world as it is. That doesn't mean there aren't some good things. You see good things, recognize them. But there's a lot of tough stuff out there and you better be clear about it in your mind. Don't kid yourself. So that's very important. I remember in the Reagan period, he called the Soviet Union an evil empire and people went bananas. So my friend Paul Nitze was testifying and one of the senators said to him, Paul, how can you serve in an administration where the president calls the Soviet Union an evil empire? And Paul said, Senator, have you considered the possibility that the statement might be accurate? <laughs> Ended the hearing. But it was realism. And uh, that's really important. Then you have to have strength. Of course, military strength. But you can't have real military strength unless your economy is strong. So we set out early on to rebuild the military, not only in terms of the, uh, the numbers and the equipment and all that, but when we took office, the military weren't even wearing their uniforms into the Pentagon. And President Reagan said, well, wear your uniforms, stand up, be proud. And people started doing it and the whole spirit changed. So uh, the strength is partly the military itself, the economic underpinnings, but also the sense of commitment and um, feeling good about yourself and proud of yourself. So that's strength. Then on the basis of all this, you, just, you ask yourself, what is your agenda? What do you want to get out of this negotiation? Don't think about the other guy's agenda or you'll wind up negotiating with yourself. What's your agenda? Then once you have these established, you have then to go and engage. But this is the way to think about uh, a problem that comes up. The worst thing in the world would be a collapse of Russia. So we need to make it clear that if that begins to happen, we're there to try to work through. Because I think one of the things that worries me the most is nuclear weapons. Early in his presidency, President Reagan asked the Joint Chiefs what would happen to the United States if there were an all-out Soviet attack on us. Answer, it would wipe us out as a country. Gone. Would he retaliate? Yes, same thing. So I heard him say many times, what's so good about keeping the peace by an ability to wipe each other out? So we sought to reduce nuclear weapons. That was before the negotiations were SALT, strategic arms limitation talks. We had START, strategic arms reduction talks. And we called for the complete elimination of intermediate range nuclear weapons. It was, there was some strong things there and it, one of the things it taught me was the difference between strength and the use of force. Strength is much more important. Here's what happened. The Soviets deployed intermediate range nuclear forces in the Soviet space that could hit European countries and hit Japan and hit China, but couldn't hit us. And the diplomatic ploy was, would we risk retaliation by their intercontinental missiles by retaliating against their use of these intermediate ranges? So we had a deal in NATO that we would have a negotiation with the Soviets, and if we couldn't get a reasonable agreement, we would deploy our own intermediate range nuclear weapons. And it was a wild negotiation, and in the end, we couldn't reach an agreement. So first we deployed cruise missiles in Britain. Margaret Thatcher uh, was able to carry that forward. Then we deployed cruise missiles in Italy. Prime Minister Andriotti was good on that. But then the big deal was deploying ballistic missiles in Germany. This was a huge thing. 
and there was a big controversy, but our allies held firm, worked with each other, and the Germans did it. It was Helmut Kohl's finest hour. The Soviets walked out of negotiations. They fanned a war talk, and we held firm. And then gradually over the next year, things gradually softened because this was a massive show of strength. Not a shot was fired, but it was a massive show of strength. And by August, I was able to go to the president and say, Mr. President, at four different European cities, a Soviet diplomat has come up to what the fires at a cocktail party and said virtually the same thing, which we think comes down to if Gromyko is invited to Washington, when he comes to the General Assembly in September, he'll accept. In other words, the Soviets blinked. To deploy against that propaganda windmill was a massive show of strength, and we put weapons in there that you had to respect. Not a shot was fired, but I think in many respects that was the turning point in the Cold War. So you learn a lot from your experiences. I think everybody has them, and you think about them. You learn a great deal.